Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to this latest uh, uh, Chatham House webinar, but it's a Chatham House webinar in partnership very much with the European Institute of Peace. And on behalf of Patricia Lewis, the uh, director of our international security program, um, and all my colleagues at Chatham House, uh, we're thrilled to be partnering with EIP on this very well-timed, uh, if challenging topic uh, of the virus, the vaccine and violence. And I think when we had this uh, uh, idea of holding this event, um, obviously struck by the very negative impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on conflict and fragile states around the world, encompassing at least a billion of the world's seven plus billion population, uh, they uh, are often a part of the world that gets less attention at moments when everyone turns in on themselves uh, as they would naturally do at this moment of crisis. We felt it was particularly important to be able to um, give real prominence to this topic. Um, as you saw from the graphic before, Chatham House is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. We've set ourselves three second century goals, goals for our second century one of which is uh, trying to help promote and, and, and get to a world of peaceful and thriving societies. And that whole peace agenda, which gets wrapped up with the SDGs and the particular SDG 16 is uh, hugely uh, threatened by the impacts of COVID, which even if COVID is not um, having the sort of decimating impact uh, directly from health effects in many of the fragile and conflict parts of the world, it is most definitely undermining them uh, in an economic, political, and social sense, uh, as other parts of the world uh, either pull back from being supportive um, or quite simply through closing their own economies and having slower growth, end up having a disastrous knock-on effects. And of course, what we'll be talking about in particular today, the way that actors within these countries are taking advantage of this COVID moment. Um, but obviously the optimistic uh, uh, gloss on this is that we are having a series of announcement, announcements on the COVID uh, uh, vaccine uh, tra train caravan um, that is emerging uh, with the Pfizer-BioNTech announcements uh, a week and a bit ago, uh, the Moderna announcement this morning, announcements about AstraZeneca, real hope that we will be starting to get these vaccines out and into the system in the coming year, but at what pace and where? And will they do something to uh, obviate the very negative impacts of COVID-19 into fragile and conflict zones? Um, I uh, am the chair of this meeting. In a minute, I'm going to turn over to our co-host, Michael Keating, the executive director of the European Institute of Peace, to say some words also of welcome and, and contextualization. Um, and then I'll be moderating uh, a discussion with our four panelists and other members of our, of our group who are here and all of you who've joined this meeting. So can I simply remind you, this is on the record. It's actually also being recorded for, for future uh, use. Um, you are most definitely encouraged to either ask questions or make comments, uh, give us your ideas and your interventions. Please use the Q&A function as your way in. Um, and we would be very happy to kind of uh, get you to ask your questions in person um, and enable you to unmute. So please indicate when you put up a Q&A, if you'd rather I ask the question or made the comment on your behalf. Um, otherwise, I will find a way to reach over to you and see if we can get you to, to engage and, and join the conversation in, in person in some, well, in some virtual form. Um, and that's pretty much the thing. I will introduce the speakers in a minute. I don't want to hold off anymore. I want to bring Michael in. Michael, as I said, is executive director of the European Institute of Peace. Uh, as I think most of you here will know, he was the UN's uh, special representative in Somalia, the UN mission in Somalia uh, through about 2015 to 18. Um, one of those really um, critical uh, and most challenging of posts, one for which he was hugely well equipped not only because of his time uh, prior to that as a deputy special representative in Kabul in Afghanistan, having worked in Gaza, uh, Islamabad, but also he had to work as associate director of Chatham House uh, before going over to Mogadishu, which had him very well trained up for all sorts of complex internal conflict. Um, Michael, uh, joking aside, super to see you. Great to be doing this event on behalf of Patricia and myself and all our colleagues at Chatham House. Really glad to see EIP and Chatham House uh, partnering on this very important event. Over to you. Well, thank you. 
Robin, and, and, and clearly my career highlight was indeed working with you and for you, and I'm glad that we're slowly coming back uh, to that. So um, I, I just want to thank Chatham House and your colleagues for the partnership on this. This is actually the culmination, although maybe it'll lead to other things, of uh, I think five country-focused meetings we've had where we've looked at the impact of the virus on people in uh, uh, conflict affected countries. Uh, we've covered places like Yemen and Syria and Venezuela and Sudan uh, and Afghanistan, not all of them with Chatham House, but several of them with Chatham House. As you say, uh, this meeting is taking place when there is light at the end of the tunnel, as it were, not only in terms of the vaccine, uh, but the, you know, the COVAX facility, the ACT Accelerator. You had nice words coming out of the G20 summit yesterday in which it was decided that you know, an extensive immunization must be treated as a, a global public good with a global public good approach, uh, which sounds great. Uh, and of course, we have the transition we hope in, in the US uh, and, and the US being back as it were. Um, but as you, as you have mentioned, the funds available uh, to help people deal with this uh, are, uh, are not necessarily commensurate uh, in uh, the global south, least of all in the poorest countries to deal with the, uh, with the scale of the problem. And we have, um, you know, which is in contrast, the amount of money that's been mobilized in, in, in richer states, of course. Um, and we have, you know, high introversion in our own societies um, and perhaps arguably despite some of these good signals, we don't really have a coordinated global response yet to addressing the needs of, of the, the poorest people and the people in the most difficult circumstances. The, um, there is a debt service suspension initiative. There are a few other bits and pieces going on, but there's nothing like a global approach. And I think the SG's call for a global ceasefire around um, the virus was an indication of that, the poor take up despite a few good examples. Um, so I, I, you know, let, me, let me just say how much we're looking forward to hearing from the speakers. I hope this results in in, 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 in ideas uh, that we can pick up and, and, and run with. Uh, clearly, I'm, maybe I'm prejudiced, but I do think there needs to be an internationally supported national level approach to these issues that brings national actors together, not just governments, but authorities and the private sector supported by the UN and whoever else is on the ground and in a position to move that forward. Um, uh, and it is going to be particularly challenging in contested areas and, 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 poor, uh, uh, and countries in conflict, but it can be done, as I suspect we're going to hear from uh, Chris Maher and maybe others. You know, there are precedents of reaching people even in the most difficult circumstances. So with that, I'm hugely looking forward to this conversation and, 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 and to benefit from the wisdom of the great group of people that uh, Chatham House and EIP has assembled for this discussion. Thank you. Back Thank you me. very much, uh, Michael. That's super um, for setting it up this way. And as you said, we've got a, a great panel. I don't want to take up any more time. Let's make sure we can swing over right and get their perspectives. Uh, I'll introduce one, each person as I go along. Hopefully you've had a chance to, um, uh, all of you who are participating in this meeting to see their bios in the invitation pack we sent over to you. But, Chris Meyer, really pleased to have you with us. A, uh, if you don't mind me saying so, a true veteran of the World Health Organization and most importantly of its immunization uh, programs. Uh, now senior advisor to the Director General um, as of uh, last year, uh, the Director General of the World Health Organization uh, in Geneva. Um, but given the work you have undertaken on polio eradication around the world, leading a lot of the WHO's work in this field, uh, not just from Geneva, but also uh, from Manila, from Jordan. I'm just wondering, uh, to what extent do you see the uh, COVID crisis really, A, getting in the way of the broader immunization efforts and therefore impacting the health security of these conflict prone or conflict existing zones? And more importantly, um, what prospects are there for COVID-19 
uh, being controlled in these uh, territories, will immunization be possible uh, at a time when uh, developed countries around the world are so determined to make sure that, that their own societies are taken care of first? Over to you, Chris. Thanks very much, Robin. I, I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, thanks very much also to, to Chatham House and, and to EIP for, for uh, asking me to become engaged in the discussions. I, I had to say I jumped at the chance. Um, I think it, it's, it's been a very interesting uh, last uh, 18 months for me, last 12 months in particular, um, as uh, COVID has, has sort of uh, evolved out into, into the pandemic that it's become. Uh, there's a there's a lot of territory that seems very familiar to me when I when I look at it, and there's also a lot of territory that's very very uncertain because it, this is this is quite an extraordinary situation I think for all of us. Um, I'm I'm certainly not a, an expert on the the economic impacts of uh, of COVID in any setting, but my natural assumption is that they are going to be far worse in settings where we're populations are already fragile economically or fragile uh, in terms of uh, personal security or whatever. But one, I mean, the, 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 the health elements, the public health elements of, of the disease basically fall into two groups for me. I mean, one is the direct impact of the disease. And, and I should point out straight away that we don't have any evidence that in any human population, uh, COVID disease is a, <laughs> has it, has a, a different or a lesser impact. We know that wherever you can be in a security compromise setting or in the, or in the middle of a, uh, of a highly developed country, this is a serious disease. And we're not going to get away with, with nothing happening in, in, uh, in security compromise settings just because populations are younger, for example. So I think it's important for us to, to to accept that straight away. This is, a, this is a dangerous disease wherever it's gonna occur. The second impact is the impact as you alluded to on, uh, on the, the delivery of other health services. And we've already seen that. We've seen what's happened with immunization programs with, uh, I mean, they're the ones of course that are dearest to my heart. So they're the ones I follow most, but the disruptions to maternal and child health care to to uh, cancer treatment, to uh, you know, control of other non-communicable diseases, you name it, it's, it's been there. Um, when, I, when I think about uh, humanitarian and conflict settings, and, and again, what our experience has been, and it's all very recent experience, is that, that access for, for just about anything is is far more complicated so not it's not just the interventions associated with with uh with the clinical side of the pandemic or looking after patients and try. it's all of the interventions associated with the non-pharmaceutical side of things and on clinical side of things as well uh, and and uh, one thing that that we have learned or been reminded of very very forcefully in the in the course of the last 12 months is the importance of community engagement and risk communication. And in so many of our, of our conflict settings, this is a very, very difficult, uh, complex area of work. Um, uh, I'm happy to come back to that later in the discussion uh, with some examples if, if, uh, if that's appropriate. I would say just looking at, at our own experience of what happens when you have to deliver a service and in particular, when you have to deliver an immunization service in situations of conflict, this is what's what's going to uh, you know become more and more critical as vaccine more and more vaccine becomes available. And how are we actually going to be able to use this vaccine in in difficult places? Um, and based my own experience, I would break things down basically into four groups. You have the the active conflict situation where you were trying to navigate yourself around a place where people are actually shooting at each other and trying to blow each other up. There is the, 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 the second situation in which there are bans or restrictions or constraints on access that are, that are instituted by local authorities or local partners, partners to the conflict, parties to the conflict. Um, 
And uh, I mean, one of the most obvious examples of that at the moment is Afghanistan with its with the Taliban ban on on house to house immunization for polio. Um, the third area that I would have uh, I would pick out is the, the, that situation of general insecurity. And I think uh, um, this is something that Michael would be very familiar with, with <laughs> from various aspects of his experience, but certainly from Somalia, whereas it's not just so simple that you have these these parties in conflict and that there's some sort of you know basic organization that operates that you can that you can deal with there is a there is an underlying general insecurity which complicates the safety of communities and the safety of health workers and the the last and perhaps the most difficult element i think in conflict settings is the deliberate targeting of health workers uh, for use as a political weapon and um you know, again, in the polio experience, we've seen that happening in in Pakistan. So we know, we know what it can do to uh, to an immunisation program. Um, I'm very much in danger of going over my time, but I, I would I would pick out a couple of quick lessons for us, perhaps that might come up again later in the discussion. I mean, one is that each of these situations, each conflict setting or humanitarian setting, is in its own way a little bit unique. And, and it's, it, it, they're, although there are common elements, it's a mistake for us to approach each one the same way. And that we, we really do need to look at the uniqueness of each situation in, in devising our strategy for, for access. The second one is particularly for say something like an immunization program to be flexible about how the vaccine is delivered. And all too often we kind of paint ourselves into an operational box. And this is how we're gonna operate and this is how we're gonna do things. And, we can't afford to do that if we're going to to reach uh, everyone in, in all settings. Um, the risk communication and community engagement uh, uh, point I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, honestly, I can't raise the importance of that enough, particularly in the conflict settings, because we know how easy it is in these settings for rumors or, or, or uh, uh, false information to become uh, widespread. Um, and lastly, I would say that, that right from the beginning, we have to be thinking about what mechanisms we're going to use to see whether or not we're actually succeeding in reaching people with our interventions. Because, again, in, in conflict and humanitarian settings, it's so hard sometimes to know what your impact actually is. Um, and my apologies for going over time. No, no, that's uh, perfect, Chris. I think you've, you know, you've set the scene very nicely, both laying out the, the scope of the risks and the, and the problem and as you said a few pointers as to how we might think going ahead you said you if, if you were just to give me or give us the two or three kind of conflict areas or countries that worry you the most at the moment you mentioned afghanistan in terms of constraints on access for for the medical uh, personnel or, or and for people to actually be able to get immunizations laid out but as you kind of take that global look around the world what are there certain parts or even certain countries that are at the top of your watch list? I, I think the, the big concentration of countries in, in what is WHO's Eastern Mediterranean region is, is to me, the, the biggest uh, set of risks, Robin. So um, Yemen, of course, uh, Syria still. Um, Iraq is, uh, there's still gazillions of, uh, of issues, problems there. Afghanistan and Pakistan in the far uh, west of that region. Somalia. Sudan itself now, uh, as well as uh, southern Sudan, as we begin to move into the African region, Central African Republic, um, DRC still is uh, uh, the eastern part of DRC is still a very very difficult place to operate, as our colleagues working on Ebola have been uh, have been uh, demonstrating in the, for the past two or three years. So yeah, I would I would yeah. pick those automatically. That's helpful, I think, just as we steer the conversation around, and actually it's. Uh, Sadly, a very good segue Ola, over to Ola al sakaf Ola, delighted to have you with us, joining us actually from Yemen, uh, one of the countries that uh, Chris mentioned on his list there. Ola, who is Program Manager for Youth Without Borders Organization for Development, uh, and also a member of the UN Network of Young Peace Builders. Ola, thank you very much for joining us. And I think I'd be very interested to hear from your uh, on-the-ground experience how COVID-19 is changing the context uh, for you and, and for the country and uh, the ability to be able to A, deal already with the conflict zone and all the challenges that brings to health and, and, and security and development, but now this extra overlay of COVID-19. Over to you. 
Thank you, and thank you for having me. Glad to be here today with you. So um, first, as you know, the situation in Yemen is different from other countries around the world. So the civilians here in Yemen are facing hardship after another, a decade of economic and political crisis, and more than five years of conflict have almost destroyed the country. Thousands of civilians have been killed or injured. Um, at least 3.6 million people have to, were, were forced to, be, to flee their homes due to the conflict. This conflict uh, involved at least six regional and international powers. So the, the outbreak of COVID-19 and the record of the first case in Yemen in April 2020 adds new struggles to the amount of suffering of Yemeni people. The war have affected the infrastructure, including health sectors. Many hospitals were destroyed and people lost their jobs. Many people in Yemen depends on daily income, so it was very difficult for them to stay at home. The out, um, actually about 24 million of Yemeni people out of 30 million uh, in need of some uh, form of aid and assistance. The United uh, Nations calls Yemen's the worst, worst humanitarian crisis. Cholera and other diseases outbreak are common here in Yemen. Water is circus, and the healthcare system is crumbling. With only half of the country's health facilities full operational, and with massive medical supply and staff shortages. So, the outbreak and COVID-19 affected the efforts of peace building badly. With COVID-19 outbreak and the sequences decreased the humanitarian funding for Yemen. Um, Actually, for us who work in peace building, the situation was very difficult. The first thing that we were forced to work online, and can you imagine working in line with the weakest internet connection ever? It was very difficult, actually. Um, but we did not stop. Many NGOs and INGOs started to um, uh, working on projects for uh, to respond to COVID-19. Uh, they supported health sectors. Youth actually played an effective role. They, uh, they volunteered to sanitize some places, um, raise the awareness of people, distribute hygiene kits and uh, prevention materials. But um, our efforts actually were not enough. Yemen recorded more than 600 cases of death. And we are just not trying to respond to coronavirus, but also to build peace and renormalize the public life. And this is making it more difficult for us. It's interesting the points you just made there, Ola, because they, uh, I think, are very important for the next bit of the conversation, um, especially on the comment you made about uh, the dependence on daily income. How on earth, you know, could people isolate themselves in the environment that you've just been describing? Um, and so maybe we'll come back to that later on a little bit in terms of the urgency of being able to get vaccines to countries where uh, people do not have the capacity to self-isolate in any particular shape or form. Um, on the flip side, but, you know, I, again, this is, it will reveal my ignorance, I'm afraid, about vaccines and so on. But um, could one be doubling up if people, if we are able to get vaccines out there for COVID, could that opportunity also be used to increase uh, health um, provision to those who come in and being monitored uh, on some increased basis. Maybe that's something we can come back to, to later on and be able to, to test as well, Ola. So um, thank you very much for sharing the situation there. We will definitely want to come back to you with some of the answers that are being uh, discussed here, uh, in particular the ones that Chris put on the table um, about uh, community engagement, flexibility uh, on delivery, um, and obviously you know how we can measure success if we're actually achieving it or not. I'm going to turn now to um, Mariano Aguirre. Mariano, um, I think known to many here from his role as a director of the Norwegian Center for Conflict Resolution, uh, NORF, um, and uh, somebody who also has worked um, uh, with the UN in Colombia. Um, now an associate fellow as well of Chatham House, our international security program, which we're thrilled, uh, Mariano, to have somebody with your experience um, involved with us at the moment. Um, could you share your thoughts um, on this crisis? And I suppose in particular, given your background, 
in uh, how you see some of the non-state actors, the people involved in the violence, in a way sort of instrumentalizing this moment and this crisis. For some people, a crisis is an opportunity, um, as negative as it might be more broadly. What, what uh, insights can you share on that front in particular? Anything else you'd like to raise with us? Over to you, Mariana. Thanks very much, Robin. Thank you for the invitation. I think that the COVID-19 crisis is highlighting the deep social inequalities and governance challenges in many countries. Um, the lack of universal health services, in many cases, their privatization has become evident and has a strong impact on fragile contexts, as some of the some of uh, has been mentioned already. For example, in 2017, the World Health Organization and the World Bank stated that at least um, a half of the world's population cannot obtain essential health services. And each year, large numbers of households are being pushed into poverty because they must pay for health care themselves. Now, if we turn, for example, to the concept, to the so-called fragile states or fragile context, as the OECD called them, we see that there are most of 57, 57 countries qualify as fragile that are in this moment insufficiently prepared to cope with the spread of the disease and its consequences across the multiple economic, political, social, environmental, and human rights dimensions of fragility. And most of the current violent conflicts are interstates and are, and are happening in this fragile context. Known as state actors and criminal organizations operate in many of these conflicts at the national level and with connections to the regional and international ones. A recent study, for example, from by Oliver Kaplan and Jonathan Moyer in the University of Denver, they, they predict and show that the Danish additional 13 countries are likely to see new conflicts through 2022 due to the coronavirus pandemic and government responses such as national lockdowns. And also in relation, I would say, is very interesting to see and dramatic in relation to peace and conflict due to the COVID-19 or related to the COVID-19, that some dialogue and mediation operations have been delayed or stopped, complicating ongoing processes in Venezuela, in Yemen, in Syria, Afghanistan, Mali, and Libya. And there is another field that I would like to stress, a very harsh reality, is the impact of the pandemic in refugee camps. Last October, for example, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees reported that globally, 21,000 of the world's 30 million refugees have tested positive for the virus across 97 countries, including Bangladesh, Lebanon, Palestine, and Greece, given the limited testing capacities in these camps. I think that I would like to, to mention, and then perhaps we can discuss it later, that the second point I would like to stress is the role of organized crime and organized crime response. Let me just tell you briefly that since the pandemic began, non-state armed actors have taken advantage of the situation where the state is fully or partly absent. And organized crime has shown a high capacity of adaptation and flexibility to changes in, I would say, their markets. Criminal groups and guerrillas in Latin America have imposed curfews, for example, in the favelas of Brazil, in Mexico, and also the ELN in Colombia, exercising greater control over populations and carrying out food distribution in poor neighborhoods. Perhaps I will, I will leave it here and we can discuss it later about this role of the non-state armed actors. Thank you uh, very much uh, for pointing out that set of problems. I mean, just one, um, before we talk more about the non-state armed groups, uh, could you just say a word or two also about the um, kind of those authoritarian governments, let's put it that way, or those who are trying to keep countries maybe in, in the lock? Um, are you also seeing examples where that's being instrumentalized, if you see what I'm saying, on the other side of the ledger rather than the non-state actors? Well, uh, yes. As a matter of fact, to contain the outbreak, many governments across the world have used what they call emergency powers to impose national lockdowns enforced by police and armed forces, and often in abusive and at least, I would say, questionable ways. This is related to the so-called securitization of the response by the governments in a very broad 
I mean, I would say arc that is going from the Philippines and India to some countries in Eastern Europe, for example, Hungary, but also we can see this kind of responses in Central America, uh, in Egypt. Um, and, and this um, is a response that not only generated additional risk for the most vulnerable, but it's just, I think a very important point to stress is that, um, you know, deteriorate even more the lack of trust of the citizens in the state. And it's something that we will need a lot of this kind of trust that is lacking at this point. For example, for the whole global campaign regarding the vaccine. Thank you for, I mean, it's not good news, but thank you for giving a very comprehensive answer and listing some of the countries and regions where you in particular are seeing these, these risks emerging. Christina, it seems very unfair in some ways to turn to you now because we've had three presentations about the worries and the problems and the challenges. Um, but your hat, if I can put it that way, and the position you've taken up in the Spanish government since February of this year um, uh, as the State Secretary for Foreign Affairs and um, for, yeah, exactly, for Foreign Affairs and the Ibero American region in the Spanish government, um, it puts you, you know, full square in the answer part of this. And I think the EU and European member states in particular have very much wanted to show themselves as leaders in this space, in particular on the uh, COVAX, uh, uh, you know, fundraising, should we say, for a global vaccine uh, program. There are a number of EU member states, as well as the EU itself, involved in the G20 uh, conversations that took place uh, yesterday, which uh, Michael mentioned. Um, and obviously, being as close as Europe is to Sub-Saharan Africa and to some of those Eastern Mediterranean uh, zones that Chris mentioned in his opening remarks were the ones he had at the top of his list. Um, could you just share with us how either the, the Spanish government and given the role that you've played also within the European Council in some of your uh, official roles for the EU as well, could you give us a feel for how you think Europe is stepping up? Has it got the bandwidth to, to worry about itself and be worrying about these spillover effects simultaneously? Over to you. Thank you, uh, Robin, and thanks to all the colleagues that have uh, preceded me. I, I, before entering or trying to reply your question with a couple of comments, I would like to refer to what uh, Mariano has mentioned, which is the issue of uh, inequalities. There is no doubt that uh, we were in a global situation where inequalities were obvious, difficult to, to tackle. Uh, many uh, initiatives had been taken place, including the, the SDGs, the 2030 agenda, which had as a, a, a major driving force uh, to uh, leave no one behind. And what uh, situation do we find in, us in is the fact that uh, the pandemic has uh, treated uh, people unequally, those that have uh, access to healthcare, those that have to choose between um, taking care of their health or having something to eat, those that um, find themselves in a, a, a situation where the lack of mobility does not allow definitely to, 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 to overcome the, the tragedy or those that have been uh, well protected by the financial support that governments across the world, in particular Western governments, but also governments in Latin America have been um, handed to workers. So def definitely we will come out of this pandemic more unequal than ever. Therefore, the effort of leaving no one behind has to be and will have to be uh, much, uh, much stronger. Uh, and that is why we look at, uh, at uh, the situation, the, 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 the situation in which we are now as a major possibility or a major opportunity to shape a new multilateral vision. It might sound, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, too, too ambitious, but I think we have to treat the situation as it is. Mind you, uh, I think a few weeks ago, we might have found this uh, even more challenging than it is now 
considering the important changes that will be happening uh, very soon, hopefully, in the United States. For us, there are a few steps that are essential. One is um, to uh, consider the vaccine against COVID uh, a global public good for a number of key reasons. First of all, because uh, COVID doesn't respect boundaries. And as long as uh, uh, it exists, COVID exists somewhere, we are all affected. Uh, second, uh, it is a moral imperative. I think we have to take this as a, a fundamental ethical approach. Uh, uh, third, uh, that this is not a cost, but an investment. Absolutely fundamental. This is an investment. Public health at the cent at the center of uh, uh, public policies because it has a direct impact on on economic and social development. Uh, third, uh, um, um, or I already mentioned, third is the is the investment one. Fourth is um, the global immunization is a driver for the stability. Uh, we, we were talking, uh, some of our uh, colleagues already mentioned other you know, tensions that will, will happen uh, if there is no global um, uh, immunization. And uh, the destabilizing factor that the lack of um, vaccination will produce in many parts of, of the world. How can we make sure that uh, this happens? Um, first of all, global solidarity, multilateral cooperation. Uh, these are the key first steps to defeat the virus. Ensuring the prices of the doses are, uh, you know, uh, what they ought to be. Uh, there has to be a, a balance equation between cost and profit and uh, um, um, citizens, companies, governments have to be at the core of, of these. Um, we will need a lot of negotiations between governments and companies, no doubt about that. And uh, this is a very good way to practice uh, goal 17 of uh, the 2030 agenda. This is probably the most global uh, partnership between public and private that we can uh, uh, face. So it's a fantastic opportunity, and so we have to we have to take it. Um, there is a tremendous amount of opportunities for research. We have already seen that uh, um, a young uh, startup, uh, biotech who was financed by the startup funds of the European Commission, which are uh, handed over by an agency, not even the Commission core, um, uh, but an agency, um, COSMET. So this is uh, really important, the type of mobilization of, uh, of science and technology research, and then Clearly, we need um, to work on how do we prioritize uh, in terms of the population. This is a major undertaking, undertaking not only in our developed countries, but in countries in particular in conflict, et cetera. Let me mention a couple of things about the EU. Uh, the EU um, was, uh, as it often happens, uh, uh, hard to get its act together. You all remember March, uh, April, countries closing, opening, all sorts of, um, of uh, geometries in terms of action, but, but the vaccine experience is probably the most solid act together of the European institutions, no doubt about that. And it already started. I, I'm sure Christopher can tell us more about how he saw the relationship between the EU, the Commission and the member states and the WHO, but no doubt that it was the movement uh, at the end of April, the meetings in May that really opened 
uh, all of us the eyes that there was no alternative but acting together. And we all saw a number of uh, 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 big events uh, uh, led uh, uh, jointly by the European Union and Dr. Tedros and some, and not some, uh, uh, heads of a state and government uh, extremely extremely active on that and what we saw yesterday at the g20 was probably an example of the manner in which the thing has been floated uh, uh, and it is true the g20 didn't provide yesterday specifics uh, and that probably is uh, is not uh, is one of the the difficulties of the meeting yesterday but i think we we have a number of initiatives covax uh, uh, etc very very interesting let me mention a couple of things about the spain i think i should mention it because uh, uh, tomorrow our government is uh, announcing a national plan for uh, global vaccination. There has been a number of um, uh, um, um, prime centers for primary health that will be, you know, the network. And not only we are taking care of ourselves, of Spanish citizens in Spain, but we have actively contributed to uh, financially to the global initiatives. Uh, Act and we have also been contributing to CEPI, Gavi, etc. So uh, uh, our contributions are are uh, are uh, we think commensurate to our uh, determination to ensure there is a multilateral uh, action to 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 this uh, global issue. Uh, some researchers speak about thirty-eight thousand U.S. million dollars needed in terms of investment. Again, probably colleagues in the panel can tell us more about this figure, but having um, uh, an impact on the global economy of 9 trillion by 2025. So, uh, um, you know, we shouldn't, um, you know, be, give a price start to every life that we are going to be protecting with the vaccine, but it is important to say that there are, those are enormous uh, opportunities. So just as a, a couple of closing remarks, uh, I think that never before uh, has a life-saving health intervention against an immediate global threat been made available to people in the global north and the global south simultaneously and at such a speed. And I think this should give us energy and should make us work together because we have a, a, an opportunity to really um, change uh, the, the current uh, situation, which is dramatic for those in conflict, but also dramatic in uh, Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, all over the world. I'd like to give uh, uh, you know, a word about Latin America, where uh, these are countries trapped in this middle income uh, etiquette. Uh, they, were, they were put there uh, several years ago, and that was going to be fantastic. But now they are losing uh, uh, um, um, much more than, than many others because uh, they are not um, uh, in a solid position financially, yep. economically, socially. So I close it. I think it is an absolute and moral imperative and only through global solidarity, cooperation and multilateralism, we are going to be succeeding. Sorry for taking long time. I'm sorry, so sorry, but uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> over to you. Lots, lots, lots of good points to have made. And uh, I've got a few people I want to bring in to the conversation as well. We've got a lot of questions, six or seven questions uh, already in the Q&A line. Thank you very much for those. Uh, and there's two people I want to bring in uh, in particular just to comment on what they've heard initially. And maybe what I'll do is get those points on the table now because then I can come back to the panelists and maybe cross ask some of the questions and then I'll go to the Q&A list. We've got a good half an hour to go, so we should have plenty of time uh, for conversation. But I'm uh, very pleased we've got Mark Malik brown with us uh, on this call, I think known to everyone here, uh, member of the House of Lords. I think importantly, in the context of this uh, conversation, co-chair of the uh, International Crisis Group, um, and obviously somebody from his time, the UN Deputy Secretary General, 
lots of uh, insights into this kind of combination of conflict and, and global responses. Um, Mark, any comment or question that you might have about the dilemma that we're, we're dealing with this in these three V's of the virus, the vaccine and the violence? Well, well thank you, Robin, and greetings to everybody who's spoken before. Uh, it's one of those exasperating panels where you're invited in to comment and you know, Michael's encouraged me to find something to disagree with you all about, and it's sort of impossible um, because, you know, I completely adhere to everything each one of our panelists have said and applaud how strongly and well they've said it. I suppose, you know, an obvious point about refugee communities particularly is they are unrepresented in global politics. In, in a, an effective way. There's the High Commissioner for Refugees, there are others who do a great job, but they are the, the, the world's stateless people. They have no state to speak up for them. We've already talked about how vulnerable they are just because of the nature of refugee camps and the concentration. But I think it is worth just thinking just a moment beyond that to, as, as, as we've just heard, I mean, it, the, the, the impoverishment and growing inequality doesn't just stop with refugees, it goes to all poor people and the World Bank estimates 120 million plus driven back into poverty. I suspect it's considerably higher in truth that number with just the collapse of the informal economy and of the SME sector in so many parts of the world and remittance earnings and tourism and service sector earnings and other things. So, you know, the, these vulnerable communities, either refugees or those in conflict states, are caught in this broader meltdown of significant parts of the global south. And so the challenge of protecting them and making sure they get some kind of equitable access to uh, vaccines, etc., you know, is, is, is made doubly hard when the whole global south is in trouble, so to speak. And so I think the challenge is you know, how on earth do we try and ensure some degree of secured protection politically and therefore translated into support for vaccines and other health treatments uh, in, a, in an effective way? And, you know, I think the G20 was a start, but it was a pretty modest start. Lots of good words expressed, but no real commitments. And so I think that's the challenge going forward. How do we build a strategy which has got some real enforcement force to it and some real political will behind it. Let me stop there, Robin, thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, very important points um, about these. You said there are many, many more that are being pushed into uh, back into poverty and therefore their vulnerability to, to this conflict. I wanted to bring as well my colleague, Patricia Lewis in, who was instrumental in, in organizing this meeting as well and has been participating in some of the other dynamics. Uh, in the context of our peaceful, thriving societies work. Patricia, any points you want to raise in particular? Then what I'm going to do is just go back, I think, to each of our panelists and ask, to ask the question, just so you're ready, that uh, Dina Mufti has asked and has gone to the top of our list of questions, which is, you know, what conflict-sensitive approaches have worked in the past and what haven't? So what are you looking for, you as experts in the field, that you think could be done this time from lessons in the past that would make a difference? Because we could spend a lot of time describing the problem here and describing it extremely well, but I'm sure that all of us and uh, the folks joining this call would love to think about answers. So Chris, just warning that you will be coming to you shortly to help start providing the answers. But first, my colleague, Patricia. Thanks, Robin. Thanks very much. And thanks for the excellent presentations and, and particularly thanks to Michael and his team at EIP for all their hard work. So as we are seeing, COVID-19 is really exposing inequalities um, within our societies and across all of our countries. Um, and I want to examine for a moment the impact of disinformation, the potential impact of disinformation, or what we might call in other days fake news about vaccines. And I think the polio vaccine program has quite a lot to offer in this regard, and um, particularly in the way that certain pieces of disinformation about what that vaccine might do to children uh, were propagated and how WHO, um, others, Rotary International, UNICEF, etc., all worked very hard to overcome this fake news, but it was a, a real struggle. And I think we've seen this also with other vaccines in, in, our, in many other countries as well. And 
you know, we need to be really prepared for this. It's already happening, certainly in, in Europe. I'm sure it's happening in the US. It's bound to happen in many other countries where people don't have access to this sort of information that we all have access to, which can at least present this scientific side. So how can we address this now? And prior to the, in particular, prior to the vaccine rollout so that we don't increase the inequalities that we're already seeing in our societies and you know, just make everything in conflict prone societies even, even worse. Thanks, Patricia. Very important points. And as you said, uh, back on this kind of lessons learned also from the polio experience. Chris, I'm going to start off with you, as I said, on, on the big question from, from Dina about conflict sensitive approaches that have worked in the past uh, and some that haven't. How would you be you know, or how are you advising, let's say, the World Health Organization and others to integrate these into the response this time? I think, Robin, actually, uh, as far as as strategies or approaches for for how do you how do you do these kinds of things in in conflict settings we're in pretty good shape i mean we have recent experience in a lot of places where uh very successful immunization activities and large scale activities were carried out quite frequently despite high levels of of conflict and i mean many of the countries that we were talking about before spring uh, immediately to mind. I mean, even in Syria in the middle of the war, in, in Somalia, in Afghanistan, and, uh, the, the, the recent ban has been uh, the, the longest period of uh, disruption we faced there. But before that, prior to that, there were many uh, shorter periods of disruption which were negotiated through, uh, strategized through to uh, to um, you know, return a basic level of, of activity. So I think that uh, you know, I'm I'm relatively uh, confident that that uh, the conflict in humanitarian crisis settings don't present an insurmountable ob uh, obstacle to introducing an effective uh, vaccine for COVID. Um, we do come back to, to those same points, though, and some of our previous speakers have made them so so uh, so eloquently. I mean, engaging communities is critical in these in these uh, settings. Let, let, let me ask you just one quick follow up before I come to Ola. Then, Chris, there was a question here by um, Suvi Parahanganas, um, uh, and she or he, I'm sorry, Suvi, I don't uh, know your name um, because I'm asked to read it in any case asked how vulnerable are COVID-19 vaccines um, to being weaponized by some of the armed non-state actor groups? Um, you know, how could they be co-opted or cooperated with? And I'm wondering, Chris, when you say we've done this before, yeah. I imagine it must have been done in many cases in some type of collaboration with non-state armed groups. What's your experience on that front? Oh, yeah, very much so. I mean, you, in, in, in many of these settings, it would not have been possible to carry out uh, activities without the, at least the the at very least the the <laughs> neutrality of of uh, of local authorities of whatever hue they were. Um, there there is always a risk with any sort of an intervention that you can have it. That people will try to use it in some way, shape, or form uh, uh, politically, or whether we wish to use the term weaponize or not. That's that's there. But again, I would say that. Uh, experience has been that we have been able in many, many difficult settings to ensure that that did not happen uh, through a wide range of, of engagement uh, activities with, with non-state armed groups, with the state, <laughs> the states itself and with communities. So I, I do believe we have capacity to do that in most situations. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come I'm going to keep pushing on it and maybe come back to you later on, but I want to get some other questions on the table, but I will come back to the issue of whether, um, let's say, donor governments, in a way, need to give some of that permission um, to various groups to get these uh, medicines out, sometimes through the non-state armed groups that are, uh, that are having to be partnered with. But Ola, let me come to you, because Paul Sellis has a question specifically for you asking um, what opportunities there are for community-based interventions where the state is too weak. Um, and he's just wondering whether 
uh, you have some examples in particular from the experience of Yemen. Is it community-based organizations that are having to step in and what can donor countries and others do to make sure they're engaging with those community-based organizations? Over to you, Ola. Um, actually, the response to COVID-19, uh, lastly, we, people here in Yemen used to depend on the NGOs. We did not have government. Actually, we have more than one government, but they are not really working as government. So uh, people started to depend on the NGOs and international NGOs. Uh, even uh, when COVID on the outbreak of COVID-19, um, we depended on them to start working uh, on the effects of COVID-19. Um, and they did, actually. Um, we didn't see a lot of efforts from our governments, uh, although they, they, they tried to do a few things, but they, that was not useful. But uh, NGOs and international NGOs uh, um, helped a lot and uh, response to the, to the COVID, but their efforts are not enough because of the situation in Yemen. It's very hard situation, it's very difficult. This is five years of ongoing war. Everything is almost destroyed. So what they are trying to do is, yeah, it helps, but not that much. So people here in Yemen start just continued their life. Some of them um, died because of COVID-19 and other reasons, and the other continue living their lives uh, as they don't have a chance or other choices. It's a desperately difficult situation, Ola. Thank you uh, for that point. I'm, I'm going to keep, we've got so many questions. I want to make sure I get to them as many as possible. Uh, we've got a very active participants group this time, which is fantastic. I'm going to hop down to, if I can pronounce your name right, Bianca Norum. As you've done two questions, I'm going to ask them on your behalf to try and speed things along here a little bit. But I think a very good one to go to you, Mariano, on. To what extent are you finding that the access to the vaccine is being used as a sort of negotiating power tool in, in some countries? And are we even finding that it's being used as a tool to try to mobilize uh, uh, against the distribution of vaccines and, and the kind of a Boko Haram Taliban type of example in polio? What, what are you finding about the vaccine being used already or the likelihood of it? And what is your worry about it being used as a negotiating tool in a conflict zone? Yes, thanks for the question. I think that, um, first of all, it would depend on the different situations in different countries and regions. Um, I would say that as a point of entry, we could say that the armed groups or the non-state armed groups, they will try to, to use vaccination, they will, as a, I would say, as an instrument to consolidate and to expand its power. It's, there are perhaps possibilities that they could I would say, um, cooperate with the central authorities. For example, a case that I know uh, well in Colombia, it's very interesting that there are some cases, uh, it's not black or white, there are some cases in which you have a full presence of the state in Colombia, areas of Colombia, and there are areas where you have no state at all, no state presence, but there are also the gray areas where you have what we can call a shared sovereignty. Uh, uh, of the local of the local authorities that are generally very weak but at the same time that they uh, through constant daily negotiations they are sharing their authority with the arm the different non-state actors and armed groups so in this particular case perhaps some kind of deal could be reached but i would say as a general principle is a moment although it's extremely difficult in the fifth, at least in these 57 states that I mentioned, a fragile context, it's impossible to think that in a few months now the state will be expanded. But having said that, I think that it's extremely important to use the vaccine as an instrument with the help uh, of the international community and with the governments that are willing to do it to expand the state as far as they can. And to expand means not just the security sector, it's to expand security, but in a broader sense. For example, let me just finish with one point that is extremely important. Every time that we talk about fragility of the state, we always think, or we tend to think, that we need security forces 
intervening in the areas where the lack is absent, where the state is absent. But, you know, it's very interesting talking with the people on the field, I don't know the experience of other colleagues here, people is looking also for justice, for example, not only services, they want justice, they want security, they want justice in their daily life, because either the justice is provided by the state, or is provided by the armed groups. So, I would say it's impossible to provide justice in a few months, but this is also a moment for an opportunity and for a reflection, not only for some government, but also for what we can call normally the donor community. Thank you. Very important points. Uh, Christina, there's a question that was in there for you as well. Um, I think I got it right. It popped off the list, but um, there's a question about the Canary Islands and the kind of flows of refugees. And the question went on. Uh, this was a follow up from Bian in Urum. Um, are you seeing any impacts on flows of refugees since COVID-19, uh, uh, either from the Spanish government standpoint or from your knowledge uh, more broadly in the EU? Um, how do you think COVID-19 and the refugee flow is interlacing at the moment? Christina, that's to you. Good question. Uh, it is true that uh, we are having for the last four or five weeks um, uh, an increase uh, a very substantial increase of, uh, of uh, persons arriving to the Canary Island, uh, refugees, migrants uh, that um, want to move on to the peninsula. And uh, they, they, the analysis of this population is that they come from um, uh, the countries in the Maghreb region. And it is clear that the type of individuals that arrive are individuals that um, truly seek a solution to their very difficult economic situation. And this is because of COVID. Mobility has been uh, forced to close the tourism industries in Morocco, which were engaging young people already trained, some of them professionals already for several years. And we are noticing that the arrivals are more of this type of population. And that is definitely an impact of COVID. And this is the same of uh, Algerian population that has been moving up uh, to uh, the um, Balearic Island or to the peninsula, Murcia, et cetera. So there is clearly an impact in terms of the numbers that are coming because of COVID. We have seen less numbers uh, from the sub-Saharan region. You know that Atlantic line has always been very much the, the sub-Saharan region moving uh, to, to, to Europe through, through the Atlantic, but um, the, the biggest increase comes from uh, the um, Maghreb uh, region. Um, so definitely there is an impact and people don't have the mobility they need uh, in order to uh, make ends meet. Or in the case of uh, the professionals that um, are crossing uh, illegally are entering Spain is because they, they, there is no jobs and the economic situation of some of those countries is very difficult. And we mentioned before, they don't have the type of social protection that we do. Now that you have given me the floor, if you allow me, I would like to make a comment on from Patricia's on Patricia's issue relating to um, misinformation or disinformation. Or yes, fake. please go ahead and do that. That would be, uh, be a good moment to come uh, in on it. A few days ago, there was a non-official uh, public opinion poll, uh, which was conducted by a media in Spain, which uh, to my mind was extremely interesting. It mentioned that over 47% of the population of Spain would not voluntarily uh, get the vaccine. So there is a lot of rumorology about uh, the, uh, um, the question of uh, vaccinating and not being you know, the right thing to do. It, although we have seen in Spain uh, the collapse of, uh, uh, in particular, certain areas uh, around the first wave of our sanitary institution. Lots of uh, people uh, uh, sadly uh, passing away, 
because of the, the illness. And now we are uh, semi confined in certain parts of our country. So despite this, there is a, a big number of our population, according to that public opinion poll, which I, I should, mention, should mention again is not an official one, but uh, 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 quite, uh, uh, quite an important media carried on. So I think there is, the, as, as it has been mentioned, a lot of misinformation around. And when vaccine campaign has to start, we really have to work on all these clarifications. Great, thank you very much for, the, for following up on that point from, from Patricia's uh, and our ISP team doing a lot of work on disinformation in general. And of course, COVID-19 is a whole nother level. Um, Chris, there was a question early on, which I've been asked to ask um, on this person's behalf, which I think sits in your bailiwick, uh, Chris, about from Rob May about the WHO and whether it's been able to, um, as he put it, kind of learn from some of its failures in the past. Um, I'm just looking up here at the question. Uh, yeah, it was quite long, um, but it, that it's been left struggling to assert and delegate its authority in recent years. Um, if so, and if political decisions will decide who lives and who dies, how can the WHO overcome political instincts to bring states and communities together? This sense that WHO has been slightly behind the curve, given the strength of the role that uh, member states play within this organization. Do you see COVID-19 kind of cracking this at all? Or is it, in any case, you answer it as you want to. I'm sure you had a chance to see that question from Rob. I, I think uh, yeah, I did see Rob's question, uh, Robin. Um, I, I, I think... Um, you to to paraphrase Chow and Lai, I think it's a little bit early to tell. You know, it's it's uh, it's one of those one of those things where we're we're not yet twelve months in, into a pandemic, which is which is something that is certainly going to change uh, uh, perceptions of global public health, and and uh, uh, it's going to change a lot of has changed and will continue to change a lot of attitudes on coordination, cooperation internationally to achieve a public health goal and, and um, coordination between countries to have an impact on, on the thing. Uh, I don't doubt that there will be, you know, knock on, knock on effects for WHO for many years to come in how, how WHO operates with member states and, and how we we learn about what we did right and what we did wrong with uh, with the response to the pandemic. So I, I think it's going to be a long process, Rob. In answer to your question, I don't think it's a short one. Okay, hopefully we can we can pick and learn uh, off this one. Um, there was a question from Lucy Fagan, who's uh, not in a position, background noise and so on, to ask it herself. Uh, so I'll ask this question for her as well about whether there's an opportunity to see. Uh, COVID-19 as a kind of an opportunity for positive responses. In other words, could we, is this a moment to overcome conflict uh, environments and situations? I'm just wondering um, if I could throw that to you first, Christina, to you. I mean, I'm wondering, and, and actually I, I want to keep looking for an opportunity to bring Michael Keating in, and we've only got five or seven minutes to go, and Michael actually uh, helped kick off uh, a project at Chatham House about how you thought of resource conflicts, not as conflicts, but as an opportunity actually to break conflict. And I'm wondering, Michael, if I can invert the question to you and whether you think COVID-19 actually might provide opportunities to, to break conflict situations. And Christina, whether you have any thoughts on this first while Michael gets ready for my uh, throw at him on this. Christina, any thoughts um, from an EU standpoint? Can you see the COVID moment as a chance for the EU and other, uh, uh, let's call them donor states or wealthier states to step in and try to be constructive in, in uh, dealing with a conflict or a fragile situation. And Mariano, I'm gonna to come to you on the agenda one in a minute. What comes to my mind is uh, Israel-Palestinian. Uh, at the very beginning of uh, COVID, um, there was a good cooperation. Although there were so many issues uh, which kept the, the two totally apart, in particular in those relate in relation to to salaries in relation to to dues uh, 
long time dues uh, from Israel to Palestine, there were quite uh, good aspects of uh, cooperation. This is the first uh, conflict in which uh, uh, managing COVID has brought uh, some elements of cooperation, of course, in, in other issues, in particularly, um, uh, uh, you know, the question related to gas, etc. The situation is extremely negative, but there has been some cooperation. Great. And Michael, a chance for you to come in here and use your creative uh, gene on this one. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the SG's call for a global ceasefire, and there are many reasons why that didn't get as much traction and not the main one by any means. But something that would have helped is if it had been linked to a plan. And it seems to me the vaccine rollout provides an opportunity for a plan. I mean, calling for ceasefires, unless it's a ceasefire for something, reduces the chances of ceasefires actually succeeding. So, you know, maybe there is still time to think about uh, what that might look like uh, in, a num in a number of, of, of places. I do want to go back, and it's still answering your question, I think, Robin, to the point that Mark made about refugees. And of course, there's also internally displaced people. And you know, the, all the world's internally displaced people are in the global south, and 80% of the refugees of the world are in the global south. And the idea that attending to their particular needs should be prioritized, I think is a great one because it's an entry point. It's an entry point. You cannot address the needs of refugees. And by the way, Chris's long list of countries, Robin, when you asked him, you know, which countries, they're all either refugee host countries or refugee generating countries, or they all have large IDP populations. And the idea that you prioritize refugees and IDPs would have immediate consequences in terms of how you engage with host populations and how you, uh, you engage with host, uh, you know, health authorities and so on, because you know, countries that have IDPs and refugees are not going to allow them to be privileged over uh, other populations. So, you know, if, if that can be used as a sort of way in, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, I mean, and the other thing, you asked for a big idea, and, you know, I, 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 I wish I had one, but it does seem to me that there is scope for a much more systematic approach by members of the Security Council, and I would argue the G20 countries, to look at some of the worst, uh, you know, the most egregious um, situations in which people are worst affected, and to be more deliberate in terms of figuring out how you persuade parties to a conflict and their sponsors uh, to get behind an effort to, to ensure that the vaccine um, does reach everyone. And I, I take Chris's point, by the way, I think it's a very good one that, you know, you didn't say this, but sometimes too much political attention can, can mess things up. I mean, and quiet conversations with non-state actors can be more effective than making a hullabaloo about it. But you do need a more deliberate approach, I think, uh, than exists at the moment. And there needs to be more systemic engagement uh, with Security Council members and G20 countries uh, on these things. Michael, thank you. We're, we're really coming up to the close of the meeting, and I want to get at least three questions in. I'm going to go to Mariano first. There's a very important question. And Ola, I'll come to you as well on this question in a second. Um, I'm just wondering whether, Mariano, in addition to the question I'm going to ask you, whether you want to uh, note at all on these moments of opportunity, do you see what I'm saying, rather than just moments of, of negativism. But um, the question I want to ask uh, both you and Ola is from Sophie de Smit. Could we talk for a minute about the gender specific risks, um, the opportunities for access to the vaccine for women and girls, and the extent to which we should really be prioritizing that dimension in conflict environments. So Mariano, uh, if you want to hook at all on Michael's points and others about uh, the opportunities here to use COVID-19 and then something on the gender, and I'll come to you, Ola, as well after it. So, uh, and yes. Christina, you'll have a last word as well. Mariano. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think it's important to see that regarding the violent impact on civilians, that the COVID-19 had already, it's very important to see that there has been a growing number of murders of women, as well as sexual and domestic violence, particularly, for example, in Latin America, and also in some countries, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
And also, it's very important to see, on the other hand, that the closure of schools that have been affecting more than 200 million primary school age children in fragile context went in parallel to the increase in recruitment of children and young people by criminal groups in some countries. In the both fields, we find that uh, women is, I would say, is, is also, uh, uh, their impact on women is really very strong. And thank you also for this question. Now, regarding opportunities, I would say very much in this field that we are discussing, it's important to that the international community, in the, with the different kind of responses that it will take in the short and midterm, will consider also this aspect of gender and will consider this aspect, I would call it inside the framework of protection of civilians, how to address this issue also of the impact on women. Fantastic, thank you. Ola, a last comment from you and then I'll come to Christina and I've got a last question for Chris. That'll be the close um, uh, on my screen. But Ola, first, on any point you wanna come in, but maybe this one also on the challenges for women and, and girls getting access to vaccines and so on. Yeah, I, I guess uh, women and girls were affected more than other community groups. Uh, even the, the, the amount of uh, violence cases have increased during the outbreak of COVID-19. Um, a lot of women were uh, killed or um, they, they, they were forced to many kind of violence during the outbreak of COVID-19, maybe because of the pressures on people. So they, women are weak, so they usually, yeah, yeah, they are affected more. And they don't have a lot of chances to access to um, resources like men, especially here in country like Yemen, because of the traditions which forces women to stay at homes most of the time. Uh, most of women are not educated. They need, uh, they are not aware of how they can get their rights. So yeah, they are, they are affected most than other, more than other community groups. Thank you very much for that point. Christina, last comment from you, then I'm going to go yes, to Chris. Very briefly, because uh, the issue of uh, women and girls uh, has been central to our activities uh, in the multilateral organizations uh, um, in along these months. And uh, we uh, launched and got uh, 80 co-sponsorships uh, for a UN uh, General Assembly resolution, which was approved uh, two weeks ago, which exactly does what you mentioned, put the focus on women and girls as, of course, victims, but also as drivers of uh, resilience and drivers of change. We were very pleased. It was very hard, uh, you know, the situation in terms of uh, uh, some countries being extremely reluctant to address the gender related issues in the UN system made it very difficult, but we have it. It's a security, it's not a Security Council resolution, a General Assembly, but we are all there because it was uh, agreed by consensus. And we are going to ensure that we get it mobilized and bring to very practical actions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that point. Uh, Chris, the last comment from you, where we've done very well, actually, we've taken a huge number of questions, and my apologies for those few that we didn't get to at the end of all of this. But Chris, I wanted to, any last comment you want to make, but can I tack in Agnes Kigotho's uh, question about uh, what could the World Health Organization be doing to avoid the risk of counterfeit medicines? Uh, I think Mariana referred and others referred to criminal organizations getting involved here. Uh, is specifically, this could become a huge risk with a massive spread out here of, uh, of new vaccines. And it, we know what will happen with criminal organizations and counterfeits. Over yeah. to you. Yeah, and there's, there, there is always a risk of that, uh, Robin. And, um, I, I think that uh, there is still a very, very heavy reliance on, on national regulatory mechanisms to, to police things like you know, vaccines and biologicals, which I think in, in most settings is very appropriate. One of the positive things, I suppose, for a lot of the places that we're most concerned about now, whether they, they are conflict settings or humanitarian settings, is that uh, we're, we're going to be talking about vaccines coming from particular sources, whether it's uh, vaccines that come through the UN system or come through the... the uh, uh, whatever mechanism the act sets up uh, through Gavi support, whatever. So uh, the vaccines that will come in 
uh, the actual vaccines will be of known good quality. They'll be they'll be good things. Uh, the difficulty will be, of course, ensuring that, that no one is doing anything in a, in a garden shed and pretending that that's vaccine. It's a little bit difficult to do, though. Um, you know, in, in many of the, of the conflict affected settings, it's, it's pretty hard to come up with, um, with uh, uh, substitutes that, uh, that look anything, <laughs> look like they're real, put it that way. <laughs> Thanks for that point. Look, I feel we, we've, well, as always, in an hour and a quarter, the best we can do is scratch the surface of this massive topic. But I think the, the diversity of views we've had from each of our panelists and with the contributions from Michael Keating, my colleague Patricia Lewis, and, and Mark Malabran as well, kind of at the beginning, have really captured, um, yes, the, the, the big risks of, of COVID-19 uh, into fragile and, and conflict uh, context and societies and for the most vulnerable uh, in those countries as well. But I think uh, it does feel to me like there is so much better knowledge of what the risks are than before, and at least an emergent appearance of a desire to try to work together on the solution. I know it's not particularly well coordinated yet, references to the G20 and the WHO in that sense, but I think stepping in the right direction. The last two closing comments I wanted to make from both Michael and Patricia to me in the chat line, Michael Keating reminding us of the critical role the private sector will need to play in these answers um, and engaging them in the process right from the beginning uh, to make sure that the uh, spread of these uh, vaccines is effectively done to somehow incentivize uh, or engage them uh, in this process so they can be, as they often do, um, provide a valuable community role in some of the most fragile places where states can't always reach with all of the social services they need. And Patricia wanted me to mention, which I think makes a lot of sense, we are fortunate at Chatham House to be running a big multi-year project called ACCEPT, X-C-E-P-T, that's funded by the Foreign Commonwealth and uh, Development Office, FCDO, um, looking at kind of war economies, cross-conflict, uh, integration uh, of risks. And obviously we're now bringing uh, COVID-19 and the responses into that mix, both how it can be used by the negative players, but also how one can use the response to try to crack their stranglehold uh, on some of these uh, war economies, as we call them. But uh, hopefully I did that justice, Patricia, but otherwise do follow up on our accept uh, project on that front. So my closing words, we're a bit over time. We've still kept the bulk of our participants, which is fantastic. Uh, big thank you to all of those who joined. Thank you for some great comments and questions. Sorry for those that we didn't get to, but I know everyone had a chance to read your comments and questions, even if we couldn't answer them. Thank you to uh, uh, our colleagues and friends at EIP. Michael, thank you very much. With great to be partnering with you on this. And Patricia, thanks for uh, on our Chatham House behalf to be leading on our side. And then Christina, Ola, Mariano, Chris, super panel. Um, Mark, good to have you with us as always. Thank you very much, everyone. And yeah, let's keep working on this. And as they say, part of the Build Back Better agenda. Uh, if we all pull together on it, we'll get that. Thank you very much indeed. See you all soon.